Uh, so in this talk, I'm going to talk about population genetics, but not game theory per se. Um, I will also, because I can't ever give a talk without talking about epidemiology, I will talk about disease at some point. Uh, you will have to forgive me for that. Okay, so um, I should start. Go back here. Uh, this talk, I'm going to talk about um, genetic strategies contro for controlling mosquito-borne diseases. And up until quite recently when I've given this talk, there's always sort of been a blank, a bunch of blank looks in the audience, what on earth is this going to be about? But I guess with the uh, recent uh, Zika outbreak, we hear quite a lot in the press about the use of genetically modified mosquitoes as a, poten as a potential control measure um, against Zika. Uh, as we go through this talk, the observant amongst you will, will probably pick out quite clearly what I think about the um, approach that's being discussed um, in, in public, at least at the moment. Um, there we go. I guess it's going to be recorded for posterity, so when I see my colleagues who work on that, uh, I'm not going to be able to run and hide anymore, am I? And I should say this work, um, this work which has been going on for the last uh, 12 years or so, pretty much my entire career at NC State, is um, in collaboration with uh, Fred Gould in our entomology department and a succession of postdocs and grad students. Um, I'd never worked on mosquito-borne diseases before. Uh, my first year at NC State, this guy showed up in my office and the entire uh, path of my uh, research, at least that part of my research career, was forever changed as a result. So the disease on which we work is uh, dengue virus. This is the most significant viral-borne mosquito uh, disease of humans. Uh, it's a virus that comes in four um, immunolo immunologically distinct types, serotypes. So a human can catch four different dengue infections over the course of their life. And it's transmitted by this little thing over here, the female Aedes aegypti mosquito. And that's the mosquito that is also known as the yellow fever mosquito. It also is a principal vector for chikungunya and now Zika virus. Dengue has causes something like 400 million cases a year. Um, and what's interesting about dengue is that its symptoms run an extremely wide range. The majority of dengue infections are um, pretty innocuous. In fact, people might not even realize they've had that dengue infection. So you have a large number of asymptomatic individuals. And then it runs all the way through to um, infections that will hospitalize people or cause them to die. Um, deaths are a relatively sm is the outcome from a relatively small fraction of dengue infections. So compared to, say, malaria, it's, uh, it's really not a very large killer compared to, say, malaria. But what it does do, because you get this large disease burden, it really has a really important impact on public health systems around the world, particularly when it occurs as large epidemics, because your local health system can be overwhelmed uh, by that. Um, you know, so you have this, uh, one of the severe outcomes is this dengue hemorrhagic fever that can cause uncontrolled bleeding. So apparently blood comes out of places like your eyes and so on. Um, yeah. Uh, there is a vaccine. So we've heard a fair bit about the vaccine in the press. Unfortunately, this vaccine is nowhere near as effective as um, we would like. Um, I guess, of course, the company that produces the vaccine tries to put a positive slant on this. Um, but public health people, I think, are disappointed at the um, uh, effectiveness of the vaccine. There is another vaccine in the pipeline. Uh, there are also no drugs, no antiviral drugs. So up until now, at least, and for the foreseeable future, the main control method for dengue is vector control, so controlling the insects. Now, these insects live in very close association with humans. The adults live in and around houses. And they lay their eggs in water containers, typically that you find in people's backyards or in and around their houses, like blocked rain gutters, that sort of thing. Um, the, what, the other thing to mention that I haven't said on these slides, I remember, and it's a very important thing for what I'm going to talk about, these mosquitoes are kind of lazy when it comes to moving. If they find an environment that they like, they, they tend to like to stay there. So many people will tell you, there is some debate about how far these mosquitoes move, but many people will tell you they don't move much more than, a few, than maybe 100 yards, 200 yards over their lifespan. 
So it's not like malaria mosquitoes that fly you know, relatively long distances. These mosquitoes, presuming they're in a place where they can find people to feed on and find places to lay their eggs, they don't tend to move around so much. Um, these, the numbers of these mosquitoes are determined by a density-dependent uh, process, which is believed to be competition for resources in these containers where the immature mosquitoes um, uh, grow. And it's actually quite surprising that we don't really have a very good handle on this density dependence. Uh, given the medical importance of this species, we know remarkably little about its ecology. So how do people control these mosquitoes? Well, they either go after the adults, so they spray inside houses. They maybe try to put larvicide in some of these water containers to um, either stop or, or retard the growth of the immatures or you try to remove these larval habitats. Um, that often is a little bit more difficult than you would imagine. So if you have an intensive control program, uh, you can do quite well about, uh, in terms of controlling Aedes aegypti, but it's pretty uh, intensive work, so it's, these are quite hard measures to sustain over the long run. When you're talking about um, spraying, uh, there are issues with insecticide resistance. Uh, one thing you you'll notice I don't mention here at all is bed nets. Bed nets, unfortunately, are not good against Aedes aegypti and dengue because these are not nighttime biting mosquitoes. They bite primarily um, dawn and dusk, so you'd have to be wearing a bed net as you go around your everyday activities, which is not desperately um, practical. So it's been recognized there's a need for alternative approaches, and so one quite large category of these alternative approaches that have been talked about quite a lot for quite a long time are using our genetic control methods, so using mosquitoes to combat mosquito-borne disease. And this first one, population reduction, is the one that we've been hearing about in the press. And this is basically an updated version of the um, sterile insect technique that was introduced in the 1950s uh, to combat certain agricultural pests by nippling. And the idea is you release large numbers of sterile male mosquitoes the wild-type females that mate with those sterile won't have offspring, and so the numbers of mosquitoes will decrease over time. Now, there are updated genetic versions of this, um, and I'll talk about one of those in a bit, but I want to talk about another one just here, very briefly mention. Um, uh, Austin Burt and Andrew Crisanti have developed a, um, a mechanism, a genetic mechanism that basically biases the sex ratio of offspring of mosquitoes. So you have individuals, uh, when, you, when they mate with them, the offspring will have uh, more than 50% male offspring. So again, you have fewer female offspring, so you'd have fewer mosquitoes in the generations that follow. Um, the other broad class of genetic control strategy, so this first one is, is trying to reduce the population, and you can imagine there are quite strong evolutionary pressures to resist, evolutionary and ecological pressures to, to um, resist the reduction of population sizes. Another approach is to replace the population with one that's less able to transmit the infection. So somehow you genetically engineer or you make a mosquito that's less able to transmit, in our case, dengue. And so people are working on making genes that somehow um, make the mosquitoes less susceptible to dengue, so that's kind of like tweaking uh, the, an immune system, if you like, of mosquitoes. And there's another approach that I'll talk about is this Wolbachia bacterial symbiont, which, uh, again, makes mosquitoes less um, permissive to dengue virus and other infections. Well, I probably don't need to tell you some of these things I have on these slides. Um, Math models have been used at various stages during this um, uh, process of trying to figure out if control measures can work and then um, uh, trying to figure out how to deploy control measures. So we've worked at all of these different stages here from using simple models to demonstrate proof of concept for a proposed control measure or indeed in some cases demonstrating that certain proposed concepts have no chance of working, which is quite a valuable thing to do before molecular biologists go out and spend 10 years of their life making a mosquito. And then uh, assuming that someone's made a mosquito, typically the first stage is to try them out in a lab or in a small-scale trial, and we've used mathematical models to help 
both design those trials and then interpret the results of those trials. So models that are particularly amenable to um, use as model fitting tools and statistical analyses and so on. And then for large-scale deployment, using more detailed models to explore impacts of spatially structured um, populations and other biological complexities, and then maybe be able to design and even optimize releases and ask questions such as economics. You know, what's the most cost-effective way to release mosquitoes, given that you have um, certain capacity and so on? Well, again, for this audience, uh, I don't really have to tell you about this. You know, there's always this uh, debate about uh, you know what sort of how simple from simple to detailed models. Um, you know, simple models that we can do mathematics on, th all the way through to detailed models that you can't do mathematics. So simulation-based models, and depending on your sort of background, your tastes, your uh, enjoyment of doing equilibrium analysis and stability analysis you find yourself or computation indeed you find yourself sitting at different levels uh, different places on this diagram from simple through to complicated models more or less realistic uh, more or less analytic power um, as i say we work at all these different levels um, from simple models all the way through to a horrendously complicated um, more or less individual based simulation um, that keeps me awake at nights in many cases, worrying about all the details. Um, one thing we like to do is sort of maybe run some of these scenarios through different models to see when they agree or disagree, trying to figure out what is the appropriate level of complexity, what, which bits of structure out there in the real world are important for particular questions that we want to ask. Actually, my favorite line on this slide is that comment there for the very detailed model. It's very easy to be seduced by its apparent realism. So you've got this detailed model that, in theory, has all this biology there, but still there's all these assumptions, particularly when it comes to parameters and so on. And of course, it's very rare that we know all the biology, so, st so there's a whole bunch of assumptions and approximations that might well um, not even be clear to us. Well, why do I worry about all this sort of thing? And the answer is that mosquito and human populations are highly structured and heterogeneous. So mosquitoes have a complicated age structure where you have the immature classes um, that, as I say, live in a particular place, and then you have the adult stage that can fly around from house to house. Um, and then, of course, people move around a city as well. And, th and these mosquitoes don't move very far, so in terms of disease, it's people moving around that's really quite important. Um, but we care about, and when I'm t in this talk here, I'm talking about the population genetics of the mosquitoes, so that's the uh, topic of focus here. And this map here, I should explain, and these pictures come from a study site. We work with a group uh, that's been working in, in Iquitos, Peru, so this is this large city that's in the middle of the Amazon, uh, Amazon jungle, and Basically, there's no roads. Well, there are no roads from Iquitos to any other large population center. So if you want to get there, you have to either fly in or go on a boat up the Amazon. Um, so this is like an ecological island. So it's quite interesting. You know, the mosquitoes don't come in and out of there much. People come in and out of there. There's a surprising number of people coming and going. Um, it is on the Amazon River. You can't see it on this map because I've just taken the GIS rather than the... Uh, the Google Maps. So the Amazon River actually runs somewhere up here. Yeah, well, this mosquito, it's kind of interesting, actually. This mosquito is living in the city. Oh. So this is, a si this is I mean, it's kind of an amazing thing. You've got this town out in the middle of nowhere, and its population now is, is getting on for 400,000. So it's, it's an enormous city. I guess it originally would have, would have grown up because of um, rubber plantations. And now it's, uh, there's a bit of tourism there. You see a fair number of foreigners there as it's a jumping off point for going out and exploring the Amazon and so on. No, you, you fly there. You fly there. So somewhere down here, uh, there's an airport. And uh, yeah, don't, don't talk to me about getting to there. Uh, I had a... I had a long journey there recently. Uh, actually, the problem, was not, uh, the problem was not there. The problem was between Raleigh and Dallas. You know, who'd have thought it? 
Yeah, it, it's kind of interesting actually. So in the city, because of the mosquito, um, dengue is the problem in the city. In the villages surrounding the city, uh, malaria is the problem. So it's kind of interesting. You sort of see how the mosquito ecology and its interactions with people uh, really do shape the spread of these infections. About 400,000, somewhere between 350, 400,000. Pro protozoa, protozoa, yeah. Protozoan, protozoan parasite. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry, there was a... Uh, it seems that almost everything exists here. Um, I don't know much about Chagas, although one of the people I work with there um, does know a lot about Chagas. I don't know about Chagas there. Um, I know leptospirosis is also a problem there. Um, and I know when I came back from there last year, I came back with a very strange rash on my back that looked like it might have been Lyme fever or s Lyme disease or something, but I don't know. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I decided I was better off not knowing. <laughs> so as I mentioned, we have this very complicated, detailed model that um, our, one of our postdocs uh, dubbed Skeeter Buster. And it's actually based on an earlier model called SimSim that actually was an acronym. Um, we took the mo that model and extended it to account for spatial structure, genetics, males. This is interesting, of course. When people are interested in transmission of mosquito-borne disease, typically they don't care about male mosquitoes because it's the females that transmit. But since we're interested in genetics, males do actually play a role in genetics. Um, and this is a very detailed um, species-specific model. So it looks at um, development of Aedes aegypti immatures. There's um, a, a resource model modeling um, development of immatures in those um, water containers. Um, it depends on weather. So because uh, mosquitoes are cold-blooded, their development and indeed the um, uh, incubation of, of dengue within a mosquito is highly temperature-dependent. Although actually that's a bit of a red herring here in Iquitos because it's pretty much a uh, tropical environment, there actually isn't all that much seasonal variation in temperature in Iquitos. We have spatial um, explicit models, so we're modeling the arrangement of houses, um, and we have stochasticity. So I'll come back to talk about this in a bit, but I want to talk a bit more about these genetic approaches. So population reduction, I mentioned this sterile male release. And when I first heard about this, this sounded like a completely crazy approach. How can this possibly work? Um, but as I mentioned before, there are agricultural pests for which this has been demonstrated to work. And the most famous example is the screwworm fly, which was eradicated from North and um, most of Central America uh, following a long program um, started off by the USDA. And they did this. So I've spared you here this screwworm fly it uh, lays its eggs in open wounds on cattle and other things, and there are like some really revolting, disgusting pictures. Um, I've saved you from that. Um, but this is, this, as I say, so this is a big agricultural issue. And what they did was, um, you have to release a large number of these sterile insects. So they turned to sort of, you know, uh, commercial scale production. So this looks, you know, to me like a I don't know, an old aircraft hangar or something which has been co-opted into building, into growing up these um, flies. So they would have been releasing millions or billions or maybe probably billions a week. And you'll notice in this map, they did this sort of in a spatial fashion. So they started off in one isolated location in the early 50s and then gradually worked around in different areas and then pushed it down uh, through uh, Central America. They just grow, well, okay, so that's, uh, I also saved you from that detail as well. Remember I said these, fl uh, these uh, flies lay their eggs in open wounds, so these flies live and grow on flesh. So, can you, so they, in these factories, they would have to have me meat from carcasses of some sort, and uh, I guess they probably uh, develop at nice body temperature. So this must not have been a very nice place to work. Uh, I went to a factory in Mexico a few years ago where they were growing um, some sort of fruit flies. And that was already quite a, um, uh, an oppressive atmosphere. It was very warm, humid. They actually had a problem with a fruit fly infestation in their factory. 
Um, so you were breathing in, and of course they couldn't use insecticides to kill them because then they'd kill the things they were growing in the factory. And um, so you were breathing in all these flies. It was, and I can only imagine what it must be like if there's meat involved in this process too. Um, and then, of course, they have to be sterilized. So the typical way they would do this is by irradiating them. So, um, yeah. And so they tried this against mosquitoes in the 60s and 70s. And they had some small-scale successes. But they had real difficulty in scaling this up to larger areas. And the things they realized that were really important, or sort of hurdles here, was immigration of wild-type mosquitoes from areas that weren't under control. And in some instances, the males they released, having been bombarded with all this radiation, weren't particularly uh, happy or you know, well, uh, yeah, well males, and they weren't very good at mating with wild-type females. There's also an issue that um, with many insect species, they very quickly adapt to, be to lab conditions and then they're not very good when you put them out there in the wild, particularly when it comes to mating, where there's often complicated mating behavior. And in the 1970s, there was a big effort to do modeling of um, these sorts of sterile insect techniques, and several of these factors and density dependence uh, became clear that they were very important um, issues. It's also interesting that it wasn't just scientific things that stopped uh, this approach or hindered these approaches. Uh, there were also societal and political issues. So, for example, a civil war in El Salvador. Well, I guess that's going to that's make it difficult to do your experiments. And um, elsewhere, accusations that the work was related to biological warfare and maybe attempts to make the local human population sterile. So that's kind of an interesting one because the, the situation there was you'd maybe have had scientists coming from the U.S. or somewhere like that to a developing world country. And you know, it was sort of seen as people sort of parachuting in, not maybe taking into account local feelings and sensibilities, and that really played against them. And so um, some of those lessons at least have been learnt um, for people who are working in this area now. And I'll talk a bit more about that at the end if I don't run out of time. Yeah, and um, you know, so I mentioned the, the company Oxitec that want to do these releases of this sterile, um, genetically sterile um, insect. And they've been wanting to do releases in the Florida Keys where they have um, dengue, uh, occasional dengue outbreaks for a long time. And there's a big public um, resistance against that. Um, yeah. No? Okay. Um, so you can make very simple mathematical models for doing sterile male releases. Um, this is massively oversimplified. I'm modeling the female mosquitoes here and imagining you re you're releasing sterile males. And what have I got here? I just assume there's like a logistic growth for mosquitoes in the absence of this release. So you go to an equilibrium. And then I'm assuming a 50-50 sex ratio so that you'd have a certain number of, you'd have the same number of wild-type males as wild-type females, and then you have a certain number of sterile males, so the chance that a given female mates with a um, wild-type male is going to be F over F plus M. So you'd have that factor there that reduces the number of births according to what fraction of the population is mating either, with, in this case, with the wild-type um, so uh, males. Little f, yeah, little f is the fecundity. Uh, little d is like the, the density independent death rate. Capital D is a density dependent death rate, so you get logistic growth. And I'm assuming that. So little d is not the derivative? No, 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 little d. No, no, no there's two little d's in this right. slide. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. That little d, it would be the um, density independent death rate. Is, is a density dependent death rate, death rate yeah. So th th this is just like a toy model. I wouldn't really, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put my life on this model, but it's one that I can, I can just sort of say, hey, this is basically just a growth, but I'm just reducing the, de the birth rate um, by a term that depends on the relative number of wild type and um, uh, sterile males. Um, F here is really, no, is really adult females. 
Oh, little f is the fecundity. So it's the rate of fecundity. So it's the birth rate per female per day. It's the number of female offspring a female has per day. And then we can look at this model. It'll go to an equilibrium, typically. And we can make a bifurcation diagram that shows uh, the equilibrium situation in terms of the number of sterile males that we have around. So this number here would be proportional to the release rate if we release males at a constant rate over time. Um, and I guess here we have no releases, so our carrying capacity is, would be 50. And then as we release sterile males, uh, the fact that we've got these sterile males around reduces the um, equilibrium population size. And then eventually, there's a um, threshold there where if we release sufficiently many sterile males, um, the population can't be maintained and it'll crash. We can drive the population to extinction. This, of course, is in the absence of spatial structure. This is in the absence of immigration of wild types from outside and so on. So this just gives you a sort of a basic idea of what you expect from one of these sort of sterile male techniques. That at first you'll just reduce the population size, but eventually they'll come to a threshold where um, density dependence is no longer able to maintain the population and it'll crash. And let's just skip the next slide. The po uh, well, well it would be the wild type, but I guess after a while you'd stop doing the release of the males. Well, I guess if you're only releasing males, uh, there's not going to be any offspring once the fem wild type females have gone away. Yeah. yeah, so the one thing you can't see on this diagram because of the cunningly drawn axis is that we, all, that we always have this stable equilibrium um, at zero. I mean, it's stable unless we have zero releases. So this is just like one of those harvesting models that we show in in like a uh, biomath type class. So there's been a resurgence of interest in this sort of sterile male technique in these um, approaches uh, with genetic engineering. Um, uh, when did these things start coming around? I, w I, I guess it must have been 2000, I think, was the uh, paper in Science and PNAS where people managed to um, make genetic variants of this sterile insect technique. Oh, it's on my slide, 2000, very good. Uh, Luke Alfie, who was at Oxford University and set up his company Oxitec that we hear a lot about, and Max Scott, um, a, I've got to get this right, I think he's New Zealander. Pretty sure, I know, it's, I mustn't get New Zealand and Australia mixed up. Uh, he's now at NC State. Um, they made this thing which is, uh, of course, if you, have a, if you have a lethal gene, you've got a slight problem because you want to breed up lots of these mosquitoes. So lethal gene is a problem to breeding up a large number of mosquitoes. Their, their advance was to find a way of repressing a uh, lethal gene. So basically you feed these um, mosquitoes uh, tetracycline antibiotic when they're being grown up, and that switches this dominant lethal off. But then when they're out there in the wild, they hopefully don't have a ready support, uh, source of antibiotics. Uh, it's a question that people ask. Um, and then this dominant lethal will be expressed, and the offspring that inherit that lethal gene uh, would die. So it's a genetic version of this um, sterility. What's kind of interesting is you can time when this lethality happens. So you could have it that the um, mosquitoes die at the egg stage, early larval or late larval, so you can, you, can you can change whether they've already been involved in that density-dependent resource competition process. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can, w again with the genetics, you can tune it so that the, the um, lethality only is sex-dependent. So you can kill only the female offspring if you want. Um, and then, of course, the male offspring, which would be okay, can transmit that gene to the next generation. Um, you know, of course, you want to kill the females because it's females that are transmitting the disease and females that are having um, more offspring. So this Oxitec company uh, have a bisex lethal strain that's been shown to be successful in small-scale releases uh, on the Cayman Islands, for, for instance. So uh, that paper was published in 2011. 
And the thing we hear about now is that they did release this successfully in Brazil. Uh, so this, there's a paper there that came out last year describing the suppression of um, Aedes aegypti in Brazil. If you look, though, in more detail at the paper, the sort of worrying thing is that they started off trying to suppress in an area of 11 hectares, and they found they couldn't produce enough mosquitoes with their facility to, to have that be. They could show reduction, but not enough reduction. So then they concentrated themselves on a much smaller area, five and a half hectares. I should have looked, at, uh, looked up what that means in terms of football pitches or something, but I wasn't uh, quite uh, sufficiently well prepared. But the point is, it's, it's a small area. So we're thinking about you know, people talking about using this mosquito uh, to impact Zika in Rio for the Olympics. That's quite a scale up from 11 or 5.5 hectares. Uh, of course, they, they would say, well, that's just a technical problem. You, know, you just need a bigger factory. But you need a bigger factory. You need more people to go out there and do the releases. You need this. You need that. And it, it's quite a large challenge. Yes, yeah, sorry. Mm. That's a good question. Um, they have maps of their areas in the paper. Um, I think the Cayman Island site was a bit more isolated than the... Um, uh, than the Rio, than the, not Rio, than the, t the place in Brazil where they did it. I mean, if you think about it, if originally they were doing 11 hectares and they moved down to five and a half hectares, which I think was, was like half of their original release site, they certainly had as large an area next to it. And my recollection of the map is that they did have areas outside of that. Uh, we've also, so our, my group has been involved with another group uh, which is funded by the Gates Foundation. Actually, the guy from Oxitec was involved here as well. Um, and this was looking at a female-specific lethal. And the idea here is that the gene actually affects the flight muscles, and so the females can't fly. Females can't fly, they can't mate, they can't bite humans. So they're not actually dead, but they're effectively dead. And... Lab, lab um, tests in labs show that this uh, approach worked pretty well. These uh, female-specific killing. Um, what do we have here? We have six cages, three control cages, and three control cage is always a, a tricky word here because you know, control means treatment and treatment doesn't mean control. Uh, three cages in which control wasn't used, in which there was no treatment and three cages in which then these uh, genetic m genetically modified um, mosquitoes were released. The numbers bumped around, uh, you know, around the sort of roughly at the equilibrium. When they didn't do the releases, in the cages in which releases were done, the population crashed over a period of weeks. So these were in you know, small cages in the lab, so maybe like one foot by one foot by one foot, something like that, maybe slightly bigger. And so then they wanted to take this and, and, and test it in the field. And as a first step before doing releases out there in the wild, they made what they call a semi-field cage, which is basically a scaled-up uh, version of these lab cages. But it's out there in the real environment. I mean, the mosquitoes can't leave here, but the environmental conditions under which they find themselves are much more representative of what these mosquitoes would find if they did a real field release. And unfortunately, there, there does seem to be some reduction, but the reduction was nowhere near as noticeable. Certainly, they didn't manage to make the population go extinct uh, within like a 20-week 20, 20 time frame. So worked in the lab, but didn't work out there in a semi-field uh, system. And one of my students, Michael Robert, had been involved here um, designing mathematical models for this genetic system. And using the mathematical model, uh, he could make a pretty good fit of those experiments we saw from the lab. And he could estimate, he could then, you know, there was like a free parameter in the model, which is the fitness cost imposed by this gene. And he could estimate that fitness cost and found that the gene imposed relatively low fitness cost in the lab. But when he fit it to the data from the field, the field cages, uh, Michael found a very high fitness cost, something like 95%. So those males that were released in, in the, in the semi-field system were really pretty poor at mating with the, with the females that were found there. And this is a bit of a puzzle. Um, 
but they did some more mating competitiveness experiments, which kind of agreed. Um, and it turns out there were some differences between the way the uh, transgenics and the wild type strains were reared, uh, which maybe explains why. Uh, and then there was maybe adaptation. So this is maybe why the experiments didn't work so well. But even supposing we have an effective um, mosquito, we were interested in asking the question with our detailed model, how, how is deployment going to work on a large scale? And so our former postdoc, Mathieu Legros, uh, wrote this paper where we, we sort of thought about releasing at the scale of a city. And um, what Mathieu found was that if you have a heterogeneous background mosquito population, so, so spatially heterogeneous, you have some houses that, that give rise to more mosquitoes than others. So maybe some people have more of these water containers in their backyards than others. Some people are better at keeping um, larval habitats down than others, um, but some people are really bad at it. Um, these are local hotspots really aid persistence because it's, it's, it's difficult to release enough mosquitoes near the places that are producing all these wild types to have this sort of approach work. Um, it might argue for having adaptive release strategies, but that's going to be pretty complicated because monitoring these mosquitoes is a difficult task, um, and then monitoring and then adapting your releases in response is going to be a really quite different, uh, difficult thing to do. So population replacement is another approach. And the strategy that's perhaps uh, furthest ahead here is Wolbachia. I should say, well, it depends who you ask. Wolbachia, some people will tell you Wolbachia is not a genetically uh, modified approach. Um, the, the people who uh, are working on this have had it classified as a biocontrol. Um, uh, some of the other people disagree with that. Uh, particularly the people who in the, in the Oxitec company who maybe have something to gain by not having it classified as a uh, biological control. But anyway, that's a different story. Um, so what are Wolbachia? Wolbachia is a, um, a class of symbiotic bacteria that infect many different insects, although not in the natural world Aedes aegypti. These bacteria are maternally inherited. So if I have a Wolbachia-infected female, its offspring typically will inherit the Wolbachia infection from the mother. And Scott and Neil's group in Australia um, infected Aedes aegypti with a Wolbachia strain that they'd taken from a Drosophila. So they have a whole bunch of different lines, one called W. Mel pop, one called W. Mel. So they take, a, they take this bacterium, which is in some other insect species, inject it into the eggs of these mosquitoes, and like in one in a hundred or one in a thousand cases, this, this bacterium establishes itself um, and then establishes itself in that mosquito species. They found two main effects of this Wolbachia bacterium. It shortens the lifespan of adult mosquitoes. Uh, that could be important because if a mosquito doesn't live, remember a mosquito to transmit a mosquito-borne disease has to bite twice and the infection has to go through its extrinsic incubation period. So shortening a mosquito lifespan could have a very large impact on the spread of infection. It also reduces the daily uh, fecundity rate of uh, mosquitoes, even if it doesn't shorten their lifespan. And then there was this unexpected effect. So actually, when they started out in this project, they knew about this lifespan shortening. And that was, what that, what, that was what they were going for. They wanted something that shortened the mosquito lifespan so that uh, you wouldn't be able to bring R0 below 1 for the, for the dengue. And then they just had this fortuitous discovery during their uh, project that it also happens that Wolbachia just naturally protects mosquitoes against getting infected with dengue virus. And it's been a bit of a puzzle. You know, why is it that these bacteria are, are there in insects you know, why aren't they lost over evolutionary time? And one of the ideas is that those mosquitoes might well, that those bacteria might well confer some um, protection to insects against viral infections that would otherwise infect insects. There might well be some evolutionary reason why Wolbachia are there in some insect species. Yes? Um, I, d I don't know of any. Uh, th this is what's always talked about. Um, 
Yeah, as far as I know, it's, um, it's maternal, yeah. Uh, the important point is that either shortening lifespan or reducing fecundity imposes a fitness cost. So Wolbachia infected females will have fewer offspring than Wolbachia uninfected females. Well, that immediately poses the question, how is it that you can get Wolbachia staying and, sp and indeed spreading in the mosquito population when it just always disappear? And it turns out that Wolbachia does something really clever called um, cytoplasmic incompat incompatibility, which is difficult to say, and so everyone just calls it CI, or at least I just call it CI. And what happens with CI is that a cross between an if an uninfected female mates with an infected male, that uninfected female either has no offspring or fewer offspring. And so if you look at the sort of mating table, infected mothers are always okay, and remember their offspring, because this is maternally um, transmitted, are infected. The uninfected mothers, who would give rise to uninfected mosquitoes, if they mate with an uninfected father, it's okay. But if they mate with an infected father, those, those crosses, those offspring are typically inviable. So we have fewer offspring than we expect from uninfected females. So uninfected females have fewer offspring than you'd, than you'd expect. Infected females are relatively more successful. And the important point here is that whether we get this well, back here, the CI-induced um, death of offspring depends on the fraction of, individ of males that have Wolbachia in the population. So we have what we heard about before. We have a frequency-dependent effect here from Wolbachia. So we have fitness costs. That is typically not frequency-dependent. And we have this CI effect, which is frequency-dependent. These two effects compete. And then the outcome is, typically, we get an invasion threshold. Well, back here, will only spread if its prevalence in the population is sufficiently high. What that means in practical terms is you'd have to release enough well, back here infected mosquitoes to overcome an invasion threshold. You can do some fun math on this. Uh, you'll notice I'm not giving you very many equations in this talk. I'm not sure if that's a good or a bad thing. Uh, you can each come up with your own conclusion on that point. Uh, but you, what you can do is, and what Paul Fine did back in the 1970s, um, I guess back then, you know, this well, back here was raj largely a sort of a theoretical or evolutionary or genetic um, uh, kind of oddity. Uh, and no one imagined back then that it would have this sort of practical um, application in years to come, you can write down a difference equation that relates the frequency of Wolbachia in one generation to the frequency of Wolbachia in the next generation, taking into account, for example, uh, the probability that an infected female's offspring will have Wolbachia, uh, the relative fitness of Wolbachia infected females. Uh, H here is to do with the hatch rate um, when you have one of these CI matings and so on. And you can do your equilibrium stability analysis and so on, and you find typically three equilibria. You have a stable equilibrium at zero, so this is when Wolbachia is lost. You have a stable equilibrium which is somewhere um, high. If you get perfect maternal transmission, this equilibrium is up at one. Wolbachia is fixed in the population. If you have imperfect maternal transmission, it's brought down below one. And in between, we have an unstable equilibrium. So um, for those of us that are ecologically minded, this reminds us of alley effect models. And you get a threshold, just as we talked about um, verbally in the last slide. If I start, and this unstable equilibrium is precisely this un invasion threshold, if I start my with Wolbachia frequency above the unstable equilibrium, the CI effect, its, its promotion of spread of Wolbachia um, is greater than the the uh, fitness cost effect that tends to hinder the spread of Wolbachia, Wolbachia's frequency increases. If I'm below the unstable equilibrium, the fitness cost effect is bigger than the boost it gets from CI, and so the Wolbachia frequency goes down to zero. So this difference equation comes from a well-mixed population. 
uh, with no structure at all. Uh, you can put this in a spatial context, and one of the simplest ways of doing this um, is in a PDE model. And a lot of these results uh, date back to Nick Barton uh, and analogous work on just general um, uh, wave invasion type things in the 1970s. And uh, Barton modeled the spatial spread of a gene subject to a local invasion threshold. And I should say you can work out a wave speed. And the math here is exactly the same as when people look at um, spatial invasion in populations subject to alley effects. Um, and the, the point is when you have an alley effect or a threshold, uh, there's a fundamental difference to the sorts of mo uh, invasions we're used to where there's no threshold, the sort of the Kolmogorov fissure type things. Um, one thing that's an important difference here in this spatial setting is that um, even if you can get local invasion, spatial spread can only happen if that unstable equilibrium lies below roughly a half. And that's because if you imagine if you've got um, like an infinite spatial domain and you've got a wave front somewhere, you've got individuals behind the wave front that are infected with Wolbachia, individuals ahead of the wave front that aren't infected with Wolbachia. You can't exceed that 50% invasion threshold uh, because you've got all these guys coming from ahead who haven't got um, Wolbachia. So you get a fundamental difference um, once you have an invasion threshold in this thing. So Wolbachia can't spread spatially if its fitness cost is too high. Uh, it's interesting, there's actually a, a real-world example of uh, spatial spread of Wolbachia that uh, Michael Chiarelli and Ari Hoffman described in this uh, famous Nature paper back in the 1990s. Uh, where Wolbachia was seen spreading through Drosophila populations in the Central Valley of California. And the wave speed there was over 100 kilometers a year, apparently, which seems really quite amazing to me for a little thing like Drosophila. But apparently Drosophila um, disperse over longer distances than Aedes aegypti do. Uh, I'm going to skip this. I'm running a bit behind time. Uh, seems to be the uh, way we're doing today. Um, yeah, again, uh, these guys, their first studies involved doing these um, semi-field studies where, again, they have these cages that are designed on the inside to, be, to simulate the natural environment in which these mosquitoes find themselves and yet are sort of uh, bio uh, protected so the mosquitoes can't escape out into the wild. And uh, they got this rather messy data for the um, invasion of Wolbachia in a couple of um, cages using a couple of different Wolbachia strains. And my involvement here was to use um, an, an age-dependent population genetic model, so something a bit like a Leslie matrix model uh, with age structure uh, to try and uh, mimic their lab data and, or, or their semi-field uh, cage data. And we were moderately successful here uh, as I said, the data is kind of messy. I guess the real world, unfortunately, is not quite like my MATLAB simulations, um, and uh, not, nor should it be. Uh, uh, what's kind of interesting, you'll notice, there are two different cages. So back, I think, on the previous slide, you see, I forget which, you have cage A and cage B, or cage B and cage A. And you'll notice, I mean, of course, this is a small sample size, but Wolbachia spread more quickly in cage B in both sets of experiments here. And that was a bit of a puzzle, except that it turned out when we asked the people that were running the experiments, there, was a, there were a couple of geckos in cage B. And the geckos would be eating the mosquitoes um, at an age-independent rate. So mosquitoes have an age-dependent survival curve, but these geckos, I guess, didn't care too much about the age of the mosquitoes. And it turns out when you crunch the, uh, when you put this into the model, if you put an age-independent predation rate, uh, it actually changes the impact of fitness cost due to Wolbachia and will change the, spray, the sp uh, speed of spread. As I say, this is like a sample size of two, right? So uh, it's a nice story, but uh, I uh, wouldn't necessarily say that it's, it's actually what happened. <laughs>
So they've gone on from this to do outdoor field trials, which in some instances have been successful, in other instances have not. And now what they're going on to do are trials that rather than have an entomological endpoint, can we get our mosquito to establish, have an epidemiological endpoint. Are, are, is the presence of Wolbachia bearing mosquitoes in a given area impacting the spread of dengue? That's a very difficult thing to measure, actually. Um, I'd be curious to see how they do with that. Uh, other population replacement approaches. Uh, people have made these antipathogen genes. So as I, I mentioned that before, again, they would incur a fitness cost. They're not going to spread by themselves. So typically what people think about doing is linking this gene to some sort of genetic uh, system that causes, that gives rise to supermendelian inheritance. So several selfish genes are known in nature. And um, so people are working on linking antipathogen genes to something uh, that can uh, promote spread. But we decided to look, ask a different question. Can we achieve population replacement without using a gene drive mechanism? Ah, you can't see what I can see. Microsoft PowerPoint apologizes. <laughs> uh, how do I restart at a particular slide? And so what Fred Gould uh, proposed doing was taking this sort of reduce approach that people had, like the Oxitec approach, and um, combining it with an antipathogen gene. So this, the, this he dubbed reduce and replace. So the idea is you have mosquitoes that have um, separate reduced um, genes and, and antipathogen genes. One of the interesting things here is that uh, because your mosquitoes have an antipathogen gene, they can't transmit dengue. So unlike the Oxitec situation, so you, I heard this on NPR earlier uh, last week, you know, if you're doing these releases, you don't want to release female mosquitoes that can transmit disease. That would be a bad thing because you could make things worse. So what Oxitec have to do is they have to sort somehow and remove all the females when they do their releases. There's a, they're actually lucky you can do this for Aedes aegypti because there's a difference in size at the pupil stage. So literally by doing a size sorting, you can, you can get rid of something like 99.99 or maybe 99.999% of females. But if your females can't transmit dengue, which they wouldn't be able to with this strategy, you can actually release female mosquitoes as well. There would be a bit of a biting nuisance. You'd be releasing individuals that would bite people, but uh, they wouldn't be able to transmit. Whether people would accept re uh, release of biting mosquitoes is another question. So my student, Michael Robert, um, explored this um, using a, what we call at least a simple differential equation model. Because we're thinking of uh, two genes here, um, we have nine different genotypes in our system. So our, quote, simple model is uh, 27 equations. Of course, for us, simple is relative to this horrendous detailed individual-based model. So that is a simple model for us. And what Michael found was that um, this approach could work. What am I showing you on this graph? The solid curves show you the uh, density of females of any type. The dashed curves show you densities of the competent females, the females that don't have the antipathogen gene. And this is for different numbers of released mosquitoes per week. And Mosquitoes are released between the two dashed lines here. And so while you're doing releases, uh, you reduce the total number of females. But once you stop doing releases, uh, the female population will come back up to its pre-release level because you've got density dependence, pushing the population back to its carrying capacity. But in the meantime, while you've been doing this release, you've basically pushed the uh, wild types down considerably so even though the population comes back, the fraction of the population that can transmit dengue is pretty small. 
One thing that there isn't in this set of simulations is a fitness cost for having the antipathogen gene. If there was a fitness cost for having the antipathogen gene, these curves here would slope upwards, and eventually you would um, revert to wild type. Although you could do small-scale um, maintenance releases to keep that population down. So it's quite interesting. Different, simple differential equation model gives us a pretty optimistic picture here. We took it into our detailed stochastic model, and we found we got mixed results here. Again, heterogeneity in the population, in the sort of the baseline carrying capacity across a city in different houses or whatever, will hinder the success of this approach, making complete replacement quite a difficult outcome to achieve. The other thing that we found that was really quite interesting for us was that when the population size is reduced down to very low levels and you have like a small residual population and then for some reason you stop doing the control, um, then the population will resurge just like we had here. When we stop doing control, the population comes back up. But what we found in the more complicated model was that stochastic effects and genetic drift could have quite a large impact. Um, and that's expressed here in these sort of histograms that show you the, the frequency of antipathogen gene in different sim uh, simulation runs. Um, so you, could, you, know, you can go, for example, here from, say, 0.4 all the way up to 0.8. And although you sort of end up doing better off on average if you release more males, the other thing we found was that the variance increased. So sometimes you could get a worse outcome if we did a stronger release than if we did a weaker release because of these stochastic effects. Because if you push that population down to really low levels, you're going to have a highly stochastic reinvasion process. Um, and, and so it's kind of interesting. And it was very surprising to us, actually, that result. And again, it's quite interesting that we got a quite different view of the world from our complicated spatial stochastic model than this very optimistic view of the world that we got from our differential equation well-mixed population model. Well, how are we doing in terms of time? Um, when was I meant to finish? I was meant to finish at 3.15, but I've got a few more minutes. But, you know, I, I, quite enjoy, I quite enjoy a coffee break, you know. So um, let, I, I'll see if we, I can help us catch up a bit. So, well, we did a whole bunch of interesting things where we looked, well, they're interesting to me at least, where we um, tried combination strategies, maybe try and reduce and then replace, or reduce and replace and then replace and so on. And it turned out, and th this was a complete surprise to us, that just releasing the antipathogen gene was more effective than we would ever have imagined. Somehow, that we could do all these sophisticated things, but just basically trying to inundate the population with antipathogen genes ended up being one of the most robust things that we could do. And that was a real surprise to us. Maybe it's because of the sort of limited dispersal of these Aedes aegypti mosquito and the, and the problems of these hotspots. Um, but Michael Robert published a paper looking at combined strategies, and Kenichi Okamoto um, published a paper looking at this in our detailed model. And we found that antipathogen-only releases were much more effective than we had any right to expect. No, no. Here, so here we're, we're going back to just differential equation models or our big simulation models. Yeah, actually, that's a very good point. I haven't mentioned that. So actually, based on our um, uh, prediction, the antipathogen only is, is going to be more effective than we uh, would have imagined. Some of our experimental collaborators have actually been trying this out in, in uh, experimental cages. We don't yet have the data, but hopefully you will soon. And... Uh, uh, my next version of this talk hopefully will have some of the analysis of cage data with antipathogen gene only. Yeah, so, so we actually, in one of our other papers, we did. 
Um, that was one looking at, at success of gene drive. So, yeah, so one of the ideas would be that you would, before doing one of these control strategies, you'd go out there and spray, so you'd knock the mosquito population down, so then, of course, your release numbers, the mosquitoes you release then are, a higher, are at a higher frequency. Um, that has also been tried experimentally, where I think people use bleach to get rid of... Um, immature cohorts in water containers, and they've shown that that can work. Um, we've done a bit of that in some of our simulations. We, ha we haven't focused much on that, in part because the main impact there is just going to be to really increase your release frequency. So we can sort of, we can mimic that just by releasing at a higher frequency without doing that pre-release control. Although it's not quite the same because the, the, there, is density, there are density-dependent effects there as well. And that actually could be really interesting. Uh, yeah, that could be really interesting. And I might, might say why in a minute. Um, so where some of our research is going, um, this was flashed up briefly somewhere else. We're really keen in using uncertainty analysis in our simulation model. We have this very detailed model, so we have a lot of um, hesitations about it. And so we use uncertainty quantification to try and understand where the, gap, where the data gaps and knowledge gaps are in the model. And in particular, we've um, been carrying out experiments in Peru. I haven't been carrying them out. We, uh, we work with people who carry out the experiments. They wouldn't let me near people's houses with an with a insecticide sprayer uh, to try and fill these data gaps. For example, looking at um, larval density dependence. The big thing that's been going on for the last few years have been uh, uh, perturbation experiments where we have people go in and spray maybe 20 city blocks with insecticide to knock the mosquito population down. Then they stop spraying, the mosquito population comes back up. So that gives us lots of data against which we can test our model predictions. So rather than just having, you know, the usual thing is you sort of have like equilibrium data, you can test your model against that. But here we're doing a large perturbation, which is something that's really going to test um, the ability of our model to make uh, predictions about dynamics. Also, at the same time, collecting mosquitoes as this reinvasion process happens, and we're having the, we have these mosquitoes shipped back to Raleigh from Peru, and they're all going to get stuck through a sequencer doing stuff that I don't have any idea at all. And we're going to try to sort of construct like family trees and actually look to see are the mosquitoes that come back, are they mosquitoes that were there before, or is there really like an invasion process going on? It also turned out there was um, insecticide resistance um, building up over the course of our experiments, uh, hopefully not due to our experiments, but uh, hopefully this genetic data is also going to give us some really valuable insights into insecticide resistance as well. Uh, we're also working on connecting all this to epidemiology. And then I said, I, I can't resist talking about epidemiology. Um, you know, we have an imperfect vaccine. We have this um, genetic control that, that maybe can work, maybe won't work. I think there's an increasing feeling that no single approach is going to be the answer. There's no silver bullet to controlling dengue in many areas. And so the, um, there's increasing sentiment that maybe con combining strategies is the way to go. And that's what um, Kenichi Okamoto, our former postdoc who's now at Yale, um, wrote a paper that appeared recently, I guess a month ago, in PLOS Computational Biology, was um, combining uh, transgenic approaches with, say, an imperfect vaccine. And, of course, there can be synergies between different approaches. Um, I mean, this is a completely obvious statement. Combination of two separately ineffective strategies can achieve control. Um, herd immunity makes it quite difficult to uh, understand if um, control is effective based on short-term observations. This is the well-known honeymoon effect in epidemiology. Um, one very important thing that Kenichi did was explore the failure of the transgenic control. This is something that's a real concern. If one of these transgenic approaches is successful and you sort of uh, reduce or interrupt dengue transmission, what's going to happen over the course of a few years is that the natural herd immunity in the population is going to decrease. So you're going to have a lot of susceptible people in the population, and then you're really at risk if your control measure breaks down and dengue is again able to spread in your, uh, in your region. That's a real concern. And of course, it might also be that you imagine if you've controlled dengue um, 
you no longer need to do like the routine spraying against the mosquitoes and your maybe your public health infrastructure can be wound down, your mosquito control infrastructure can be wound down. You could be in a really bad situation if your transgenic um, approach broke down in a few years' time. Worse than that, Kenichi found a really surprising result in this paper um, in that uh, failure of transgenics, and I think this would be failure of other vector controls as well, could actually increase the total number of cases over certain time horizons compared to if you've done nothing. So this is a stronger effect than the, than the honeymoon effect in epidemiology, um, where you can have a transient increase in the number of cases, but the total number of cases will always be less. Um, I have to admit we don't fully understand this. I have a grad student who is going to work on this this summer, and hopefully we're going to really understand what's going on here. But it's a combination, I think, of loss of herd immunity in humans and a resurgence of the vector population. So there's a lot of interest um, right now in this so-called CRISPR-Cas9 technology, this gene editing technology that we hear a lot about. Um, both in terms of the this sort of molecular biology uh, advances, but also, I guess, the number of lawsuits and patent lawyers and so on that are involved in all this right now as arguments continue about um, who developed this, who had the ideas and so on. But there are several groups, um, one led by Kevin Esfeld at Harvard MIT and uh, one with um, Ethan Beer and Tony James, who are looking at this, and also, I guess, um, Bert and Crisanti, who are looking at the potential for this um, technology to um, help develop gene drives. And Ethan Beer had a paper that was in Science just over a year ago called The Mutagenic Chain Reaction. Uh, he, he wasn't interested in gene drives at the time. He was kind of interested in Drosophila genetics, and he discovered this technique for turning um, heterozygotes into homozygotes, which is exactly what you want to do for a gene drive. And then he got together with Tony James and a paper that came out right at the end of last year. Uh, they had engineered a strain of um, Anopheles stevensi, which is um, a malaria vector in Asia, that had both an antipathogen gene and a gene drive. So that was a pretty significant advance. So we've used models at various stages in the development of these technologies. I think my, the lesson I've really learned is that these stochastic spatial models often give insights that aren't gained uh, from the simpler differential equation models in our setting, uh, revealing really quite important impediments to success. So that's why you know, the structured populations and the fact that we have finite populations really is um, important. So I can't talk about GM without sort of just, I don't have to tell you that genetically en genetic engineering is controversial. Um, in terms of foods, you know, there's um, a, a big difference. I guess there's a big movement that doesn't like genetically modified foods, uh, particularly where I come from on the other side of uh, the Atlantic. Um, and so, as I said before, these sorts of technologies can't be seen in a purely scientific um, setting. You have to see them in the societal um, context. Um, and so when you're thinking about doing releases of these transgenics, there really is a need to engage. Well, like you, you're going to have to engage the government, uh, health officials, but also local communities, because they have to agree that releasing these mosquitoes is something that wants to be done. Um, it's important for risks to be honestly assessed. Uh, that's often difficult for the scientists who have, like, um, skin in the game, you know, but you, you have to sort of say that, you know, things can go wrong, so, you, you know, the virus can evolve resistance or your genetic construct can break down. And so it really does argue for a cautious approach. And just to mention, at NC State University, uh, we've, we've had a program for a few years now, um, one of which is an IGOT program funded by NSF that brings together people from uh, the sciences, social sciences, humanities, to explore these technologies and um, both their scientific and social aspects. And I mentioned these genetically mo um, engineered mosquitoes in the Florida Keys. And I guess at one point, some of our um, people uh, were involved in doing polling down in the Florida Keys about people's acceptability. It's, kind of, it's been kind of interesting, actually, this whole Zika business, because it seems that the, you know, the fact that Zika affects um, babies and so on has maybe changed the way that people see this. And, and um, you know, I guess already with dengue, the, public, the fact that it has a public health impact 
changes the discussion from, say, transgenic foods, where people say, you know, why do we need these things? But then Zika seems to be um, a stage further. At least that's the impression I've got. Okay, I'm more or less going to finish there. My acknowledgments. Uh, this has been funded over various times by NIH. Um, the Gates Foundation, as I've mentioned, uh, Fred Gould and a whole cast of characters at NC State. Um, various people involved in these other projects with whom we've worked. And I always like to put up this slide. Uh, if you think the... Uh, so some of you might have seen this TED talk on this. You know, uh, there's actually, this is an old slide. What is that? 2009. So, you know, if you think the idea of releasing mosquitoes to com combat mosquito-borne diseases is crazy, this to me is a much crazier idea. <laughs> Shooting lasers at mosquitoes. Um, this guy, I guess, used to work with Bill Gates or something at some point, Intellectual Ventures. And there's a TED Talk where I think he, they actually have a demonstration of a mosquito zapping a laser. Actually, there's a, so you can look it up on YouTube. And that's where I'm going to finish. <laughs>